DNA is very long and cumbersome. The strands of DNA also code for many different proteins. To get the code for the desired protein from the nucleus to the ribosomes in the cytoplasm, a copy of the small necessary section of DNA will be made. The copying process is called transcription, and it occurs in the nucleus. It's the first step in protein synthesis, the process of making protein. The second step is called translation. A portion of the DNA is unzipped so that the mRNA can be made from the DNA like a template. That's transcription. Nucleotides of RNA match with one strand of DNA and make mRNA. RNA polymerase unzips the DNA and puts RNA nucleotides into the right place. C and G nucleotides match up, A and T nucleotides match up, but anytime the RNA places a complement to an A on the DNA, it places a U instead of a T in the RNA. Remember, RNA uses uracil instead of thymine. So, if the DNA strand looked like this, the complementary mRNA strand would be the complement, but each time there would normally be a thymine, there's a uracil in its place. The mRNA also doesn't copy the entire strand of DNA. It only copies the portion of DNA that codes for the protein it wants at the time. In fact, most of DNA doesn't code for anything. Only about 2% of it codes for protein. So the small section of coding DNA has a start and stop signal. After the mRNA is formed, it moves out of the nucleus through nuclear pore and goes into the cytoplasm. Remember, there are three different types of RNA. The purpose of the mRNA is to get the protein code out of the nucleus without pulling the DNA out of the nucleus. Then the mRNA will need to find a ribosome in the cytoplasm. Ribosomes can be found on the rough ER or floating in the cytosol. mRNA is read three bases at a time, and these three bases are called codons. Now, the ribosomes are made of protein and RNA, and the ribosomes are the protein-making machines that read the mRNA code and add the correct amino acid using tRNA. Remember, tRNA stands for transfer RNA, and that's because its purpose is to transfer the right amino acid to the ribosome to build the protein. The tRNA has an anti-codon on one end, which will match a specific codon on the mRNA, and has a specific amino acid on the other end. Together, these three parts will make translation happen. Translation occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell wherever there's a ribosome. To get translation started, mRNA attaches to a ribosome and a start codon must be read. It's usually AUG. And I remember that school starts in August and that helps me remember AUG. The first amino acid is brought in by tRNA. The anticodon on tRNA matches up to the codon on mRNA. Then, the next tRNA molecule moves in and matches up with the mRNA codon. This time, the amino acids form a peptide bond and link together. Then, the first tRNA can detach and the mRNA shifts through like ticker tape, and the next tRNA molecule can come in. The protein grows until a stop codon is reached. Once the stop codon is read, the protein is formed and ready to finish folding to become functional. And that's the end of protein synthesis. There are four major categories of evidence for evolution. Fossil evidence, anatomical evidence, embryological evidence, and biochemical evidence. Let's look at fossil evidence first. Fossils are often used as evidence for evolution. They're the traces or remains of dead organisms that lived long ago. Sedimentary rock contains the most fossils and is formed from mud, sand, silt, and other fine particles. To make a fossil, first the animal needs to die and be quickly buried under the mud or silt so that no other critters will be able to break down the dead animal. Over time, the minerals in the mud and silt will replace the tissue of the animal and will later reveal a mold or cast of the long dead organism. The law of superposition is that older layers are on the bottom and younger layers of rock are on top. This allows us to relatively figure out the age of different organisms or fossils that we find in layers of rock. So an organism found below another organism would be older than the one on top. So letter Z is older than letter X in this case. Absolute dating places a numerical age range using radiometric dating 
luminescence dating, dendrochronology, and amino acid dating. Some scientists prefer not to call it absolute, but chronometric or calendar dating instead, because the word absolute makes it sound much more certain and precise than it really is. It's still an estimation, like the relative dating of rocks based on the law of superposition, but it has a number to it. For example, in dendrochronology, scientists count the rings in a tree to estimate the number of years that have gone by. Differences in growth through the seasons create a ring, and it generally takes one year, but there can be some variation. Transitional species are intermediate species, which may be in the fossil record or could be missing from the fossil record. It's proposed that there would be evidence of species that were in the middle evolution steps from one species to another. Archaeopteryx, pictured here, is used to provide a link between the theory that birds evolved from reptiles. Now we're going to start looking at the anatomical evidence for evolution. Homologous structures help scientists find relatedness among species. There are anatomical structures in different species that originated by heredity from a structure in the most recent common ancestor of the species. For example, if you look at the bone structure of a pterodactyl, a bat, and a bird, you'll see some basic similarities. This suggests they had a common ancestor with a similar forearm structure, perhaps very long ago. But if you look at how they use their forearms for flight, they're very different. The pterodactyl has one long finger that spans a large section of the wing, the bat has a wing between its fingers, and the bird has feathers all along the forearm. These are analogous structures because even though they have closely related functions, they do not have a common ancestor for that function. Each of these species evolved their ability to fly from a different ancestral line. Vestigial structures are another piece of evidence because the structures seem to serve no function, but resemble structures with functional roles in other organisms. An example that's commonly used is the human appendix. The appendix was thought to be a shrunken remain of the cecum that can be found in many kinds of herbivores. The idea is that it's a remnant of evolution yet to be truly removed. In 2013, however, scientists refuted the relationship between cecum size and appendix presence. The appendix is actually a housing complex for mutualistic bacteria that aid in digestion for many species, including humans. Embryology is the study of the development of embryos. The more closely related species would be similar in their earliest stages of development. These exaggerated drawings by Ernst Haeckel were used to show similarities between early stages of an embryo among different species, including salamanders, pigs, and humans. And while they're not truly accurate, they were some of the first attempts at using embryology as evidence for evolution. Today, the stages are studied at the same point in their evolution, unlike these images. Lastly, when we read DNA and amino acids to find a quantitative way to organize evolutionary ancestry, we're using a molecular clock. Mutations happen at a steady rate, and the more mutations there are, mean a more distant relationship between the species. Fewer mutations means a more recent common ancestor. So, based on the amino acid differences between human hemoglobin and gorilla hemoglobin, gorillas are the closest relative to humans on this list. And lampreys are the furthest.